Hi, this is Dr. Justin Essery, and this is week eight of PolySci 506 Bayesian Computational Nonparametric Models. And this week, we're going to talk about uh, measuring uncertainty in statistical et estimates with nonparametric approaches. Uh, one of the key features of uh, statistical analysis is that uh, it not only tries to uh, model what we do know to extract information from a data set, <clears throat> but it also tries to uh, tell us what we don't know or what we're uncertain about. Now, obviously, there are limits to this. Uh, a model that could tell you everything you didn't know would be uh, a pretty good model. Um, if anyone ever comes up with that, they really have something. But uh, one thing we certainly can do is say that uh, given a set of assumptions that we've made about, about a model, um, and given the data that we're seeing, uh, we can narrow down um, a knowledge to a certain range. We can say that uh, our best estimate, given the model and the data we have, is, is inside this range. But we're uh, less certain uh, where a relationship lies inside of a particular range. Uh, that idea, the idea of quantifying uncertainty, um, of not only trying to um, recover information about what we know from a model, but recover the fact that we're not certain about what we know from that model is really um, interesting um, and important part of statistics. And uh, the focus of this week's talk is uh, trying to, to do that approach um, by adding uh, less parametric structural information from the model. Uh, and now, before I get into um, how a parametric approach to estimating uncertainty might differ from a non-parametric approach, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what's going on here and, and what are the sources of our uncertainty um, in, in, a, in a statistical model. So like I was just saying, uh, we know already that uh, any statistical model is going to give results uh, that are uh, imperfect. And, and by imperfect, I mean um, they, they could be structurally mistaken, but they also, even if they're structurally correct, are going to be somewhat uncertain. <clears throat> There's going to be some error in the prediction, most likely. And uh, uh, you know, our, our, our goal of the model is try to minimize those imperfections as much as we can. Uh, but it may be the case that um, even in very ideal circumstances, there is an extent to which we cannot resolve uncertainty. There's ultimate, there, there are ultimately unresolvable sources of uncertainty uh, or variability in our estimates. And so, in so much that that exists, we want to capture and recognize that in our modeling procedure. So um, the first question I want to start by asking is, uh, where does error come from? Why, why are our models uncertain? Um, some of these sources of, of error are, are resolvable. We can maybe limit them or, or, or narrow them down by doing something, but some are not. So uh, for example, one source of error uh, in a model is sampling variation. Um, <clears throat> right, right at the time I'm recording this lecture, there's a, a presidential election in the United States underway in 2012. And so there's a lot of attention in the media focused on polling data, trying to figure out how people are going to vote, you know, what people are thinking about right now politically. You know, do they prefer Mitt Romney or Barack Obama for the presidency? And uh, quite obviously, um, no polling firm um, or even the government has the resources to ask every voting American what they think, uh, particularly they can't ask them what they think every week. We have to take a sample out of the population of American voters and, and ask them what they think, maybe a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, something like that, and then use that information to extrapolate um, what the rest of the population thinks given that sample. Uh, but obviously um, samples are not uh, all alike. <clears throat> uh, you, you, there's uh, even in a perfectly implemented sample, uh, uh, even in a perfectly representative sample of the underlying population, um, there's going to be uh, some extent to which you don't exactly mirror the underlying uh, population distribution um, of opinion. So um, sampling variation is uh, the variation that we see uh, because our samples are not perfectly representative. So um, the error that uh, accrues to results uh, because even properly implemented
sampling procedures. Uh, do not perfectly mirror the underlying uh, population uh, because of chance, random chance, I should say, in who is selected uh, for the sample. So um, this is not a, a, a lecture about sampling theory or, or sampling procedures and survey estimates, which in itself would be a quite involved topic. There are lots of ways of doing it. Um, and all of these ways uh, make a best effort to try to recover um, a sample that looks like um, the underlying population. Um, and it should look like the underlying population in ways that are relevant to the thing you're asking about. So for example, if we're asking about presidential election uh, opinion, um, we want a sample of voters, uh, because those are the people whose opinions matter uh, if we're trying to project an election outcome. And we also want a, a, an a, a sample that's representative of the underlying distribution of opinion in the population. And given that we know that opinion varies by race, sex, age, education level, ideology, all those things, we try to uh, geography. We try to design um, sampling procedures that, ha that give an equal chance of selecting um, uh, all of those different groups in the population. Now, the simplest way of doing this is you know, simple random sampling, where you assign every single person in the United States a number from 1 to 300 million and you know, draw those numbers out of a big you know, urn or something and pick the ones whose numbers are, are, are called and ask them what they think. It's a little hard to actually implement, but that would be a, a way of doing this. But even in that ideal procedure where you really are, you know, simple random sampling gives every single person, voting person, if we can narrow it down, an equal chance of being selected. Um, <clears throat> just because in expectation the, uh, the, the, the sample looks like the population doesn't mean every single sample looks like the population. Everyone knows uh, that, for example, even a fair coin, right, a coin that has a 50% chance of coming up heads and a 50% chance of coming up tails, Sometimes you flip a coin and you get six heads in a row or eight heads in a row. That happens from time to time. And that happens, that happens in random sampling procedures as well. You know, you have some variation due to random chance in who you select and who gets into that population. And that, that is a source. That randomness in chance and who gets selected uh, becomes a source of variation in um, opinion estimates that we derive from that, from that sample. So that is a source of error in estimates that come out of a model. Um, there's also sort of a, um, well, we'll, we'll there's a, another interpretation of this that I'll delay a little bit till we discuss the second source of error. Um, now, there are ways of minimizing sampling variation non-methodologically. Um, the easiest, uh, I say that in quotation marks, but the easiest way to do that is just to make the sample bigger. Um, the bigger the sample, the more likely it is to be representative of the population, assuming that your sampling procedures are valid. Of course, it costs money um, to, to sample to get to gather a bigger sample, and it and it takes time to gather a bigger sample. And so, it's easy conceptually, but uh, hard to do uh, in practice. So, there's a sense in which this is a resolvable source of error in our estimates, um, but there's also a sense in which it's unresolvable given the the reality of that our samples are always going to be limited. So um, we can see this as a sort of fundamental source of uncertainty in our models that we're just simply going to have to deal with. Uh, another um, source of potential error is uh, noise in the data generating process. Um, what I mean by that is uh, suppose that we actually have the entire population. Um, we are observing the entire population. So this is common, for example, in IR data sets, international relations data sets, where we're studying you know, countries' uh, behavior over time. It may be the case that we have every single country for a given time period um, uh, that we'd like to study, and so we are observing the population. There is no sampling variation. Uh, nevertheless, it may be the case that um, the outcomes themselves are uh, randomly generated, which is to say that um, the, the, the procedure or uh, data generating process that we're studying is itself irreducibly random. 
So let me give you an example of this. Uh, there, there, are, there is a theory um, popular in the IR community that uh, war is, at least in part, uh, a fundamentally random outcome in the sense that um, it occurs due to um, factors which we normally attribute to the error term. Uh, what I mean by that is that, um, generally speaking, um, a peaceful resolution of a dispute would be less costly to the actors involved. And so um, the fact that a dispute arises must be because they disagree about the fundamentals of the dispute, whether who can win or, or their likelihood of winning or um, so, some other, there's some disagreement about what they think about the dispute. And that disagreement um, generates, uh, generates the potential for um, conflict outcomes. But that disagreement may um, be in part uh, driven by the fact of uncertainty. Um, in other words, there's uncertainty about information. And the degree of uncertainty means there uh, could be noise in what people think, which is to say uh, what the, 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 the analysis that a leader makes of the situation may be uh, itself random. The assessment they make one day may be the different than the assessment they make six months from then, owing nothing to um, underlying fundamentals but having to do with random variations in what kind of intelligence they've got or, or even such things as their psychological mood. And so it's the case that um, that process, the process which generates conflict outcomes, is itself noisy. Now in the, the natural world, we see this all the time. There are lots of data generating processes uh, that are not completely deterministic. They include error uh, or noise. Um, you know, there, there are lots of examples uh, for, you know, the, the easiest one to always bring up is uh, quantum phenomena where the randomness is, seems literally intrinsic to the process. But even macrosco uh, macroscopic events like, for example, you know, weather patterns. Weather patterns uh, we think of as being largely deterministic, but there are so many factors that influence them uh, in the long run. Um, for example, there are so many small um, differences that can drastically change in the long run the path of a hurricane that predicting the path of that hurricane uh, becomes very difficult beyond a few days because very very minor differences almost attributable to to uh, you know noise in in wind currents and, and temperature variations uh, in a, at day one can really make a big difference about where that storm ends up in day three and those differences are, are, are too small for us to measure um, so if you know just to sort of write down a version of this if this is what the data generating process actually looks like, that is our data generating process, that means that there is a noise term in the data generating process that we cannot make go away. It is, you know, it's random. It has some kind of distribution, you know, so often we model it as being normal. It doesn't mean it actually is normal, but we could say it's normal, um, close enough to being normal. Um, Sometimes people say, well, the error term includes things that we don't know yet uh, or that we can't explain or that we're neglecting for ease of interpretation. That's true. Things that you would neglect will end up in the error term. Uh, what I'm saying is that even if we had a completely perfect model of the world, at least for some uh, things we're studying, um, it would, there would still be randomness. There would still be noise, and we'd have to deal with that. Um, so these two um, aspects of, of uh, randomness in, or error in estimates are, are, irre are irreducible in some way, and, and we're just trying to deal with them and to recognize that they uh, make our estimates hard to, uh, hard to nail down. Uh, it's hard to say, for example, who's going to win the presidential election next week uh, uh, for the reason that um, the outcome may not be determined. Uh, we may know there's a 70 or 80 percent chance that Obama is going to win. That doesn't mean he's definitely going to win. That means there's going to be a roll of the dice on that day, and there's a 70 percent chance it comes up Obama and a 30 percent chance it comes up Romney. Uh, but there is a third source of um, uncertainty, and that's the uncertainty that um, comes in from uh, model misspecification, uh, which is to say that um, we're not necessarily sure that the model we've written down is the right one. Um, and, and this is something that's actually somewhat hard uh, to um, methodologically or econometrically capture because um, it's hard to uh, get a sense of, you know, how do we know this model is wrong and how wrong is it? Um, how good is our approximation to, to what we're doing? And um, 
a part of what I want to get at today is that uh, non-parametric approaches to um, the estimation of uncertainty um, in in a uh, uh, in a statistical model are designed to minimize uh, this source of uncertainty. Um, but that means they may be less efficient at uh, uh, at minimizing the other two sources of uncertainty. So for example, if I know the exact process uh, by which uncertainty is generated in a, in, a, in a model, and I know the, it has a parametric form and I know it, um, I can probably um, build that into the model and very efficiently you know, tell you the uncertainty bounds that are going to come out of that data generating process. But if I'm not entirely sure about um, what the uncertainty um, data gener where the uncertainty in the data, data generating process comes from and what it looks like, um, then there's that additional source of uncertainty um, present in the fact that I'm not exactly sure what this model is supposed to look like. Um, and and uh, building a parametric model might be a good enough approximation or it might not be a good enough approximation. So uh, bootstrap um, and other non-parametric approaches to uncertainty estimation are designed um, to uh, remove um, uh, model misspecification uncertainty, um, uh, or, or actually, uh, here's a way of putting it. They're a way of um, making model misspecification uncertainty a non-issue by hopefully making a data generating, pro uh, uh, an error generating process um, recovery mechanism that's robust to many different kinds of, of error generation. Uh, the price we're going to pay for that is um, in wider confidence intervals and more uncertainty. Um, a little bit inaccurately, somewhat intuitively, we can interpret this as being the uncertainty price we pay for having uncertainty about what our model looks like. Um, of course, there are all sorts of other reasons to use uh, um, um, non-parametric uh, models of, of uncertainty. Um, in some cases, it's because we actually can't write down um, what the parametric model looks like. Uh, but these are some issues that uh, maybe we can delay a little bit until we talk about what a parametric approach to measuring uncertainty would look like and uh, where it might fall down. So let, let's just uh, go to that right now. So uh, a parametric approach to measuring uncertainty um, effectively says uh, we know um, the, a structure uh, within which uh, the data generating process is happening. Uh, that structure includes some integrated uncertainty. Uh, there's an uncertain part of the DGP, for example, um, or there's some kind of uh, sampling error. And uh, we're going to extract the degree of uncertainty um, out of the, uh, uh, of the model um, using those assumptions and information that's present in the data. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, in an, an ordinary least squares regression, um, we're usually, what we're interested in is the degree of uncertainty in some kind of uh, parametrically uh, estimated relationship, like a marginal effect. You know, I want to know whether um, when something goes up, something else tends to go up or down. And, uh, you know, I want to know when uh, the economy gets better, does the uh, presidential incumbent tend to do better in the election or worse? <clears throat> and uh, the way I might measure that is by running regression on past election results in, in the economy and economic performance and see what the relationship is. And if I run a linear regression, what I've said is, well, the relationship to those two, between those two things must be linear. Um, and uh, there's a parameter that... that uh, that measures the marginal relationship between them, the, 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 uh, the coefficient parameter beta. And uh, so my interest is in the uncertainty in that parameter. So uh, uncertainty in the estimated effect is uh, often, although certainly not always, um, rooted in uncertainty in parameter estimates. And then uh, in turn, uncertainty in the parameter estimates is de defined on, uh, by the model. And so uh, in part, our, our estimate of uncertainty in the parameter depends on the uh, quality of the underlying model. And by quality of the model, I mean how well does that model approximate the data generating process? How, uh, how much do its assumptions do abuse um, or are they uh, unreflective of, of movement in the DGP? So um, in order for these things to work, we need to have, perhaps not totally accurate, but say sufficiently accurate uh, specification of the model and, and whatever variance estimates are going in, such as the variance covariance matrix, in order for these things to work. Um, let me give you a very a simple example of a, a parametric uh, estimate of uncertainty. Uh, when we do a two-sample t-test, <clears throat> we need to calculate um, the difference of means uh, between two samples. 
and we need to figure out, hey, are the, is that difference uh, something we would consider statistically significant or is it attributable to sampling variation or, or noise in the data generating process? And so, you know, the, comparing the means of the two samples is easy. We just, you know, subtract the two means and, you know, see if they're uh, not equal to zero. But then we've got to see, is that difference uh, statistically distinguishable from noise? Uh, well, if, um, if under the null we have um, uh, that the difference is equal to zero, so that the two means are the same, uh, and the distributions of the two populations, um, one and two, uh, their variances or standard deviations are, are unknown, uh, but estimatable. Um, and uh, we're not sure whether these two things are, these distributions are, are equally spread out. So we're uncertain about that. We're going to allow them to be different. Uh, then the critical T statistic uh, that we would use is, well, uh, let's look at the um, estimated difference in the populations and then divide that by our estimate of the standard error of the difference. So standard error of the difference, right? And then we calculate the standard error of the difference as um, the standard error, estimated standard error of the first sample um, divided by the size of that sample. And this should be actually the, the variance here, this estimated variance. Uh, um, plus the uh, standard error of the, uh, this should be one here, sorry. Uh, incidentally, um, the reason my notation is shifting is because I'm literally taking this straight from the state manual. Um, this is a very, very common test to run. Uh, and they use the X and Y notation instead of the one and two notation. Um, you know, add to that the uh, estimated standard error of the, of the second uh, sample, and then uh, take the square root to get back to um, a standard deviation. Now, uh, is that a reasonable estimate um, of the standard error of the difference between those two uh, distributions? The diff or I'm sorry, I should say the standard error of the difference between the means of those two distributions. Um, well, um, maybe, maybe not. Um, there are a few assumptions that go into this. For example, we have to assume that the, um, there exist finite um, variances um, of the two distributions that we're comparing which may seem like a trivial thing um, to, to assume, and it, it usually is, but there are some um, uh, distributions which are not especially well behaved, um, and there are some circumstances where um, uh, this uh, finite variance assumption won't apply. Um, so uh, you can fall down on that, on that point. Um, the one thing that's nice is that the distribution of means, um, regardless in some ways of the underlying distributions of the samples, the distributions of the difference in their means, um, we can appeal to some central limit theorems and you know, say that these things are distributed T or in very large samples normally. Um, so we, we, we don't make too many assumptions here, which is actually a good thing. But a little later, I'm going to show you an example where even this very, um, even this very mild um, uh, set of assumptions um, creates a test which won't won't work um, at least in some uh, in some cases um, and uh, whereas a non-parametric test that doesn't make those assumptions will work better now <clears throat> a much easier example um, in terms of parametric assumptions to lay out is how, how we construct the variance covariance matrix of beta hat so as as you know uh, uh, an ordinary least squares regression model, you know, does something like this, where we're looking for some kind of linear relationship between um, a bunch of, of x's. Um, we just label these x1 and x2, and so on, um, up to k. Uh, and our estimate of, of y is going to be um, like so. Uh, now we know that these parameters <coughs> are uncertain. And so we can construct a, um, a, merit, uh, a matrix of the uh, variance and, uh, variances and covariances of these beta hats, uh, the VCV. Uh, and under the usual OLS formulation, uh, the VCV is given by our estimate of the standard error times X transpose X inverse, where um, X transpose X um, inverse is uh, the um, square matrix formed by multiplying the matrix of regressors uh, transpose times itself. Um, and of course there are various ways of, of, of getting this estimate of the standard deviation of the regression or standard error of the regression. Um, if I recall correctly, the usual way of doing this is just um, 
1 over n minus k um, times the uh, sum of squared errors. Um, or also, if we want to stick to matrix notation here, u transpose u, um, where k is the number of regressors. Uh, so um, that's fine. It, it works under many circumstances. But obviously, a lot of assumptions are built into this construction of the variance. Uh, you've probably already um, discussed at some point in one of your various classes that um, if uh, the uh, variance of y of the error term epsilon, you know, because as you know, in the underlying data generating process, y x beta plus epsilon, so this is the true value of y, there is this epsilon term. Um, if epsilon is, non -homo is not homoscedastic, if epsilon does not have a constant variance, so if epsilon uh, does not have um, constant variance, then uh, the assumption that we can estimate um, the VCV using sigma hat squared is going to break down. Um, and there are various fixes that we can apply to that. We can apply, you know, White's heteroscedasticity, robust standard errors, or Efron's variant, or any number of other techniques to do that. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, it's important to know that there's a parametric assumption that's being leveraged in order for us to say that this variance covariance matrix of the betas makes sense. Um, there, there are other assumptions as well. I mean, a, a sort of obvious one is that um, the data generating process looks like this. Uh, if it doesn't look like this, there's no way to get to this VCV um, in its convenient form, and there's no guarantee that um, approximating this VCV um, with uh, a line, so approximating a nonlinear DGP with a line, is going to properly recover um, our, tr our, 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 our necessary level of uncertainty in our fitted values y, y hat, sorry. Um, what I'm saying to you here is that um, if we're using OLS as an approximation tool, which in my opinion we almost always are using it as an approximation tool, <coughs> and then it's the case that our variance-covariance matrix uh, may or may not be a good summary of the true degree of uncertainty we ought to have given the fact that our model is an approximation and given the fact that the uh, that you know the betas are, are the best a beta the best set of betas that would approximate um, the DGP are uncertain. Um, so you know linearity or um, another way of looking about this is, uh, or look at talking about this is um, proper model specification. If we don't have that. Um, it, there's no guarantee that our, our uh, models make sense. Uh, and of course, maximum likelihood estimates, um, I, I don't want to go into great detail about how these um, uh, uncertainty estimates are recovered. Uh, in short, it, ha it's a, it's a transform it's, uses the information matrix, uh, so-called, um, the, uh, the, the uh, gradient of the Hessian gradient that comes out of a maximum likelihood estimate is the source of is how we uh, measure the uncertainty in, in an estimated model, um, typically speaking, with a, with, under an MLE framework. Um, but the same kind of ideas apply um, in the sense that if the um, likelihood function that you're using to approximate the data generating process is, uh, is not a perfect match to the actual data generating process, then there's no guarantee that the... Um, uh, uncertainty in the um, beta hat estimates you produce for maximum likelihood are um, necessarily going to um, uh, be a the the best uh, statement of uncertainty about the betas or beta hats I should say. In other words, there um, it may be the case that uh, these beta hats are actually um, more uncertain, um, possibly less uncertain, but probably more uncertain than you realize. Um, and the curvature of the likelihood function, um, which, as you know, depends on the sample at hand, um, may or may not um, fully tell you that. It may not, uh, may not, that uncer that source of uncertainty may not filter uh, through fully to the standard errors. So, <clears throat> parametric um, models of uncertainty um, are, are useful and good, um, and, and, uh, but they are approximations. And much as uh, we used a, a kernel regression approach um, to uh, 
or relax that assumption and allow us to get a better estimate of the mean, um, we're going to use a non-parametric approach to uncertainty um, to relax those assumptions and perhaps give us a better estimate of the uncertainty. So let's do that. Uh, so to give you a, <coughs> a sense of how one might non-parametrically um, assess variance, I want to start off with a really simple example. Uh, and this example um, is the uh, Mann-Whitney or Wilcoxon uh, rank sum test, uh, which is described in, in many, many places, um, including many statistical textbooks. But uh, if you have a copy of State 11, you can also check out the State 11 Mann page, which gives you a sense of how this works, um, which would be freely included with your state of software. Um, but basically, um, what happens in the Man whitney uh, wilcox on rank sum test is that uh, we're trying to decide uh, whether two um, uh, samples that we've gathered uh, come from equivalent distributions. So we've got you know, a sample of, of something, and we've got a sample of something else. These might be two response variables um, for two experimental groups that have been subjected to different treatments, for example. Uh, and what we want to know is, uh, do these things come from the same distribution or not? Um, so, is it the case that uh, the distribution of x1 is the same as the distribution of x2? Um, and in particular, um, we want to test to see if the medians of these two samples are equivalent. So, uh, the question here is, are the medians of x1 and x2 the same? And the null hypothesis is that they are. Now, you might immediately say, um, hey, we've got another um, more parametric tool to do this, a uh, two-sample t-test that we just described. And, and that's, that's correct. Um, the two-sample t-test, a mean comparison test, is uh, aimed at the same goal, <clears throat> trying to assess whether uh, two uh, distributions are the same, and in particular, whether uh, two distributions have the same uh, mean or not. Uh, but the man whitney rolcox on rank sum test uh, is uh, more parametric. Uh, than a two-sample t-test uh, because it makes uh, no distributional assumptions. Uh, there are actually uh, a couple of different ways uh, to talk about this test. In other words, there, there are multiple ways to, uh, to get to it. Um, uh, but the, the easiest way to um, describe it is probably to talk about it in, uh, in the following way. Um, each one of these samples has a bunch of different observations in it. Uh, so for example, in, uh, we'll just, I'm just going to denote these samples uh, x and z. To, to make it a little bit easier. So uh, maybe I'll go back and change these uh, so that we have consistent x and z. And we want to know if the medians of x and z are the same. So um, we've got a bunch of different um, observations, you know, x1, x2, x3, all the way up to x sub n. And then we've got a bunch of observations, z1, z2, and so on up to z, m, and m does not necessarily equal n. Uh, what a rank sum test does uh, is it says, let's compare every two possible pairs of, of uh, observations. So we'll start by comparing x1 to z1. And we'll just see uh, whether it's the case that x1 is bigger than z1. And uh, if so, we'll denote it, and if not, will denote it as zero. So we'll, so we'll code this as a one or a zero. Um, so rank x1, z1, we'll just code that as a one if x1 is bigger and a z, um, and a zero if not. Uh, we compute this rank statistic for every pair, uh, possible pairing of observations in the two samples. Uh, so uh, what we do is we say, okay, um, uh, just add up the, uh, the number of uh, ranks, and we'll call this uh, U. This is the Mann-Whitney U statistic. Um, it is the uh, uh, sum of the number of pairs for which... Uh, xi is bigger than zj, and we're going to sum this over i and then sum it again over j. Uh, and it, it can be shown, um, basically by combinatoric theorem, uh, that we, um, if the two distributions are equal, um, we expect a certain um, uh, distribution of this statistic. 
Uh, in particular, uh, we expect um, this statistic to follow a, a certain uh, distribution. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, is it the case that uh, this statistic, uh, this u that we've computed, um, follows this distribution uh, or not? Uh, is it the case that um, we can distinguish our observed value from what we would expect under the null? So u has a distribution under the null. Uh, but that distribution is given by uh, combinatorics only. <clears throat> um, and all we need to do is just uh, see whether uh, the computed u that we see is well inside this distribution or not. Now you may say, wait a minute, there's a distribution that kind of sounds parametric to me. Well, note that nowhere in here have I specified anything about the characteristics of the X and Z distributions, and nowhere in here have I specified um, anything about you know computing means or anything. I'm just comparing ranks, um, and if the distributions are the are the same, no matter what those distributions are, um, we expect to see a certain um, distribution of U. So it's non-parametric in the sense that the distribution U does not flow. Uh, the distribution of u under the null uh, does not flow um, from any distributional assumptions regarding x, z, or the difference between them. So, uh, in essence, what we say is under the null, we expect to see some kind of distribution of u, um, and we're going to um, calculate our particular u statistic, um, u0, and we're going to see um, whether it's the case that uh, our u0 would occur under the null a lot or a little bit. And uh, the area shaded to the right here is going to be um, uh, the one-tailed p-value um, for um, the, I guess it would be the first sample being bigger than the second sample because that would mean the sum of um, ranks would be higher than normal. So it's a very simple and very old test. This dates back to the, the 40s. Um, and it's commonly implemented in, um, for example, a testing of experimental hypotheses for treatment effects where we don't want to assume any kind of uh, distribution of um, the test statistics. Uh, now, we can show by performing uh, this test that uh, in R, under some sample conditions, that it actually does uh, a bit better um, than we might expect uh, under a, under a, than a t-test under similar conditions. So what I've got here is just a little, um, I'm actually going to start off, let me uh, clear my console here. Uh, one second. I'll clear my console and I'm also going to uh, clear my memory. That's generally a good idea before you start any analysis. You should actually add that to the lecture file there so that everyone clears their memory before we get started. Make sure there's no, nothing hanging around from previous sessions. And I'm just going to set some uh, seed so that we all have the same random variables in our memory. And I'm going to draw x and z, um, two variables from the Cauchy distribution. And these are going to have different locations. And so if you plot the uh, non-parametric density of, uh, of um, x and z, um, you'll see, actually, it's probably best if we do this via box plot here. Hmm. You can see that we've got a very high variance um, in, uh, in our estimates here, which is... Uh, natural because the Cauchy density has very, very fat tails such that its uh, variance is, is uh, uh, odd. Um, in, fact, um, in fact, the Cauchy variance is, is undefined. Um, and so you can see that in the fact that our distributions are, are pretty weird looking here. But if we just look at uh, inside the limit b between y equals 5 and y equals negative 5, you'll see that the second sample here, as we specified in the location parameter, is a little bit bigger than the first sample. Uh, but the variance of this uh, distribution is undefined. So if we um, uh, run a t-test comparing uh, x and z for a quality of means, uh, what you'll see here is that um, the p-value for the, for the difference test uh, is 0.3767, which is not statistically significant. It's telling us that there's no difference 
in, uh, in these two distributions. One is not larger than the other, it doesn't have a bigger mean than the other. But if we do a Wilcoxon rank sum test, uh, we get a very, very small p-value, which tells us <coughs> that the location shift is not equal to zero. In other words, that one of these distributions is bigger than the other, and by looking at the box plot, we can immediately see that it's the z. It's the z distribution that's bigger. So the Wilcoxon rank sum test um, detects a statistically significant difference um, uh, in, a, in a case in this Cauchy distribution where the t-test doesn't. And if we do this over and over again, you'll see that we get similar answers over and over again. So two sample t-test, uh, p-value of 0.6 versus a p-value of 0 again. So again, the t-test is not finding a difference and the Wilcoxon rank sum test is. Same thing, same thing. T-test is missing it almost every time. Ah, the t-test finally did get a statistically significant result there. But the Wilcoxon is nailing it much more. So um, there are some simple, simplistic cases here where uh, relaxing the distributional assumptions about the underlying dependent variable, uh, uh, yeah, the underlying dependent variable, um, can be useful at detecting differences uh, where a more parametric approach would fall apart because the assumptions are not supported. In this case, um, it's difficult to approximate the variance um, for a t-test because uh, the, the variance for a Cauchy statistic or the Cauchy distributed variable is not defined. Now you might be asking yourself, how likely is this going to really happen in, in applied data? Well, not that often. Um, probably it's going to be the case that in, in, in most situations a t-test um, has reasonable enough um, assumptions that it will um, do a good job of, of catching um, statistically significant differences where they don't exist, or where, or where they do exist, and uh, ignoring them where they don't exist. Um, <clears throat> but the Wilcoxon rank sum test is, as we've just demonstrated, at least in some situations, a little bit more robust. And, and so in very generic data analysis situations, it's likely that a t-test will suffice. But if you have a, a situation that's a little bit different, you, your um, data is not exactly um, well-behaved, it's a little bit non-normal, um, something is going on that might lead you to question um, the assumptions of the t-test, um, whether the central limit theorem applies or whatever, it might be a good idea to um, do some Monte Carlo simulations to see if the Wilcoxon rank sum test behaves better um, under the circumstances um, of your particular data set than uh, a, an ordinary t-test. And in, 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 in my case, um, uh, I've noticed that many researchers that, that I work with experimentally just default to using Wilcoxon rank sum tests because they are uh, the, the more free of assumptions, and so uh, they feel like they're letting the data speak for itself more than um, we might by imposing the normality or the t the t distribution structure that we do with a t test. Um, now, again, you know, central limit theorems allow us to do that for difference of means tests because you know means there are central limit theorems that typically apply in these cases, and we can we can sort of make it work asymptotically. But something to think about. Uh, that's a very um, simple, controlled example. Uh, uh, now, most of you obviously are going to use much more complicated models, which are going to have much more complicated assumptions uh, structures, and um, as a consequence, probably more fragile um, assumption structures. And so now let's uh, take a look at a more complicated example where we relax assumptions and look at the consequences for estimates of uncertainty. So now I want to talk to you about a, a a generalized procedure um, for handling uncertainty in a non-parametric way uh, called bootstrapping. Uh, we could, in fact, apply bootstrapping uh, or bootstrapping-like procedures uh, to the um, two-sample uh, mean comparison test that we just conducted as an alternative to the, uh, the um, uh, Mann-Whitney-Wilcoxon rank sum test. Um, but, of course, the, the advantage of bootstrapping is that it's not limited to these uh, narrow scenarios. It's applicable in a wide variety of scenarios. Uh, the idea behind bootstrapping um, is pretty simple, um, although you can certainly go uh, as deep into this subject as you want. Um, you can see I've got this. Uh, this is uh, where some of the readings for this week um, come from. Uh, um, a book about bootstrap methods and their application by Davidson and Hinckley. It's a thick book um, and a very technically complicated one. Um, uh, it's not the only book on the subject. There are, are several. Um, there's a, a somewhat famous book by Efron and Tipsharani, I think, about bootstrap sampling as well. Um, so the idea is simple, but uh, there are lots of complexities that uh, you can quickly get into if you want to start really thinking uh, seriously about this. 
Um, but the basic idea is uh, the following. Hey, uh, we know that our estimates are, are variable and uncertain. Um, but rather than try to do something with estimated error terms um, to, uh, to capture that uncertainty, um, instead, uh, instead of estimating those error terms, we're going to um, try to uh, simulate the process of sampling. Um, sampling uh, is a source of uncertainty, quite obviously, in a, in a regression uh, or in any kind of statistical analysis. And so maybe we can figure out um, something about the uncertainty in our estimates by um, reenacting the sampling process and seeing how our results change in different samples. Now, of course, that leads you to an, uh, ask the question, well, where are all these new samples coming from? Um, <clears throat> well, we'll deal with that in a second. <laughs> they, uh, we have to find some way of sampling um, repeatedly. And, and actually, as it turns out, what we're going to do is pretend as or, or treat the sample um, that we have as though it's the population and then repeatedly sample out of that um, with replacement. So that's what we're gonna, that's how we're going to simulate the process of sampling. Um, but we're gonna do, we're gonna somehow get these samples, we're gonna um, estimate the model on each simulated sample, we're gonna um, recover whatever thing that we're trying to estimate on each sample, and then uh, once we've done this a lot of times and we've got a lot of different samples, we can look at how our estimated um, effects or parameters change um, in each sample. Uh, so what we're doing is we're uh, recreating the sampling distribution of a statistic um, without taking repeated samples from the population. Uh, we're going to take repeated samples instead from our, uh, from our uh, underlying um, data set, from our sample, from our data set. Which uh, sounds a little uh, strange, um, but it's intuitive in the sense that if sampling repeatedly from the population works, um, maybe sampling repeatedly from the sample will work too. Uh, and as it turns out, it works, it works quite well. So let's uh, take a look at a couple of different ways we can implement uh, bootstrapping. So I'm going to start with an example of uh, uh, parametric bootstrapping that you might be familiar with um, if you've taken some previous courses in political methodology or in, in statistics. Um, a parametric bootstrapping uh, in general is um, using uh, distributional assumptions of a parametric model um, as the uh, source of resampling. So uh, what we're going to do is um, sample um, out of the distribution uh, that is uh, provided for us by a fitted model. Um, it's called parametric bootstrapping because Obviously, it relies on the parametric assumptions of the model that are creating this distribution uh, that you're sampling out of. Uh, the benefit of doing this, however, it is, is that it allows us to estimate uncertainty in quantities for which we cannot solve the parametric distribution uh, of its... Dis uh, uh, but what we can say that um, we can construct its uncertainty, or it, we can construct it from... Um, from quantities for which we do know the parametric distribution of its uncertainty. So uh, a very simple example of this is um, the case of estimating um, marginal effects out of uh, regression models with interaction terms. So I've got a, a little model here with x, z, and x times z being used to estimate y. There's a, a, an uncertainty term, as usual, an error term. Um, we estimate this model on a data set, and what we want to do is uh, plot dy dx against z. Now, if you just take the derivative here, um, dy dx for the model, you'll see um, that it is uh, beta 1 plus beta p z. That's the derivative. And so if we want to estimate this marginal effect, how much does y change with x, we need to know the value of z. And if we want to know um, the uncertainty around that, we need to calculate the uncertainty for this quantity. Now, in some cases, uh, for example, in ordinary least squares regression cases, there is a formula uh, for, for calculating this uh, uh, exactly. Um, and so, for example, we could say, well, I just need to know uh, the variance of beta 1 plus beta pz. Um, and the uh, formula, the identity for the variance of a sum of random quantities, is uh, variance beta 1 uh, plus the variance of uh, beta pz 
uh, plus 2 times the covariance uh, between beta 1 and beta p z. Uh, the z term comes out because it's a constant, and so this becomes, the second term here becomes z squared variance beta p, uh, and the z term comes out here as well, um, but it comes out once because it's a covariance instead of as a square term, uh, beta 1, uh, beta p. The first term stays the same, um, and uh, we have derived the exact formula for um, uh, computing the uh, uncertainty around a marginal effects estimate in a, in a, um, a linear least squares regression. Um, this won't always be the case. Uh, there are going to be some um, quantities for which we don't know the exact distribution. Um, for example, when we simulate um, quantities of interest out of nonlinear models like a logit or probit, um, it's going to be much harder to come up with um, <clears throat> exact statements of the of the uncertainty around those estimates. And so we're going to have to do something else. And we can do that something else in the case of regression models as well. What's the something else? Well, the something else is this. I know how dy dx is constructed. It's constructed out of beta 1, beta p, and z. Right? Right. So what I want to do is uh, determine the uncertainty around this. Well, the uncertain quantities in this, uh, in this equation are beta 1 and beta p. I'm going to consider z fixed and certain for this analysis. Um, that means that I could what I could try doing is I could try saying, okay, well, uh, I'm going to simulate um, a lot of um, estimates of beta 1 and beta p out of my distribution for these two things. Now, I should say... Uh, the true quantities um, don't have distributions, right? So um, in practice, we're doing this with estimates. We've estimated all these quantities out of a model, and uh, as a consequence, we don't know the distribution of the betas either. We've estimated it somehow using uh, uh, and and actually. Really, well, there's two a couple of different ways of looking at it, but we could talk about there being distributions of the estimates. Now, what's the distribution of the estimate going to be? Well, by various central limit theorems um, we can, um, we, that we can invoke, we could say that uh, this distribution is going to be normal um, with means given by the uh, estimated beta hat quantities, and um, that's our best guess anyway. And um, with uh, standard deviations given by um, the estimated um, VCV matrix. Now, the actual distribution of beta hat is going to be given by the true values of beta and sigma, right? So, um, if if we if we knew the this, the true state of the world, we would say that um, in in the limit of, uh, of of a very large sample, these things will be distributed around beta and sigma, um, where those things are the true. Um, variance covariance matrix and, and mean vector. But we, of course, only have estimates of these things that we've constructed from a data set. So we're going to plug in our estimates of the VCV and beta um, and say, those are our best guesses for the population parameters. We know that in the limit of, of an infinitely, technically an infinitely large sample, that um, beta hat and, and sigma hat are, uh, I'm sorry, that these beta hats are distributed normally um, with a mean vector of beta hat and a a VCV of sigma hat. Um, this is incidentally the uh, VCV from the regression. Uh, and this here is just the uh, fitted MLE coefficients. Uh, the normal distribution part of it comes from a central limit theorem that says that these coefficients get normally distributed in large samples. So uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we say Let's just pull a lot of draws of beta 1 hat and beta p hat out of the asymptotically normal distribution for beta hat. Um, and for each one of these draws from the distribution, we'll compute dy dx or dy hat dx. And then, once we've done this a whole lot of times, we've gotten a whole lot of draws, we've computed a whole lot of dy hat dx's, we now have, in effect, a simulated density of dy d hat. So um, recover um, OLS or MLE um, coefficients um, and the VCV. Um, plug 
um, estimated coefficients in the VCV into the asymptotic distribution of beta hat. Simulate many draws from beta hat, uh, of, uh, of beta hat, I should say, not from beta hat. For each, oh no, yeah. Simulate many draws of beta hat from the asymptotic distribution. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. And then compute dy hat dx for each draw. And then the resulting collection of dy d hats forms our estimated or simulated distribution for dy d hat. Uh, this is, in, in, in short, what the clarify package of Kings, Toms, and Wittenberg uh, published a couple of years, a few years ago now, I guess <laughs> it's more than a few years ago now. Uh, that's what this is designed to do. It's designed to um, take uh, a fitted model, um, use, the, uh, use some assumptions about its asymptotic distribution of its parameters, simulate draws from that asymptotic distribution using the fitted coefficients, and then construct out of those draws more complicated quantities that we can then compute over and over for each straw and therefore get a uh, distribution of the complex quantity. So uh, that's, um, that's, what they're, that's what we're doing. Um, we're, we're doing, uh, in short, these simulations. Uh, and uh, this is parametric bootstrapping again because it relies on um, our assumptions about the model but also our assumptions about the asymptotic distribution of the coefficients. Uh, how is this applied in practice? Well, um, this approach is often used, like I said, for computing um, these um, interaction term coefficients, and, uh, and we can um, repeat that process in R and give you a sense of how it's done and what that product looks like. So let's do that now. All right, so uh, here is my um, fake data that creates a, a model um, of interaction. Uh, you can see I've got two variables, x and z, and their product, x times z, uh, constant term. Uh, here are the beta coefficients on the constant x, z, and x, z uh, in that order. Uh, and what I'm going to do is uh, just use a bit of uh, matrix algebra to construct the model, which is why I guess x beta plus a normally distributed error with a specific standard deviation. That's it. So uh, then what I'm going to do is uh, just output that data um, as a state of data file and then clear my memory so I've got nothing left in memory and try to recover the data generating process uh, using just the data. So I read the data back in that I just created and it's as though I just loaded a data set. Uh, so here's my linear regression model. You can see here's x, here's z, and here's x times z. Um, and uh, if you look back at the beta coefficients, we're doing a decent job of recovering um, the beta coefficients uh, that we specified. Um, but we, what we want to do is see what the relationship between x and, and, and y is. Uh, and you might say, well, here's the beta coefficient on x. It's you know, 2.6, so every one unit increase in x causes a 2.6 unit increase in y. But that's not true. Um, that marginal effect is going to be different um, at every value of z. And for some values of z, it may even be statistically insignificant because you can see this product term coefficient is negative which means that as z goes up, the marginal effect of x on z, I'm sorry, the marginal effect of x on y is going to get smaller and smaller and may even converge to zero. Uh, so what we do um, is uh, compute the, um, uh, the uh, dy dx um, using the formula we laid out earlier, uh, and we compute the um, standard error of that quantity, and I actually don't need to save the EPS file, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, and I'm going to start off by using the exact calculation, um, which, we, uh, which we noted in the notes. So this is, um, given that this is the uh, true model, ooh, ooh, what's going on here? Oh, what's going on is I forgot to save the coefficients in VCV terms. <laughs> here we go. Uh, so, oh, shoot. So there's the marginal effect of 
uh, x on y at all sorts of different values of z. Um, and I've got the 95% confidence interval plotted around that. And because um, this model is a, you know, is a linear model, it's not an approximation, this is the exact um, this is the exact replication of the underlying data generating process, those 95% confidence intervals are going to be um, the best linear unbiased uh, estimate. Uh, they're blue. So um, these are perfectly fine, perfectly, you know, they'll work. Uh, but we may not, <clears throat> in practice, always know that that approximation is good. And for non-interaction terms, or for interaction terms in nonlinear models, we may not know that formula. We may not be able to solve for it. So uh, now what I'm going to do is demonstrate the simulation approach. So um, what I'm going to do is, uh, you can see right here, I've got, um, first I'm going to start the, uh, by drawing the line again. Uh, and I'm going to draw a thousand um, draws out of the multivariate normal distribution with the mean of the estimated beta coefficients and the uh, sigma um, of uh, VCV. So now I've got a thousand draws of beta. And if you just look at head beta dot draws, you'll see for each coefficient I've got tons and tons and tons of, of drawn beta coefficients out of the um, out of the posterior, or, well it's not a posterior density, it's actually just a, uh, <laughs> it's only a posterior density if the prior is flat. Um, but if you do a if you do a plot for or a density plot, for example, of uh, of x beta draws, uh, let's see, would be all rows and column x. There we go. That's what um, all those draws. That's what the distribution of those draws looks like. Um, it's normal uh, as we would expect, and it's centered around our coefficient estimate as we would expect. So what I'm going to do is use those beta draws to compute dy dx at values of z, z fits here, from negative 10 to 10. So that's my dy dx draws. And now if you just uh, look at head of dy dx draws, I've, oh, I've got a ton of uh, different um, estimates. Um, and actually, I should probably just look at the first column of these, all rows, first column. Um, this is for uh, the dy dx when z is negative 10. That's the first column. Uh, this will be for when dy... Oh, actually, it might be... Ah, so it's actually z fits in rows, replicates in columns. So that's for when, dy, uh, that's for when um, z equals negative 10. Uh, this is for when uh, z equals uh, negative 9. Uh, and if we go all the way to 0, there's that. And if we go to, hmm, yeah. Anyway, so there's our, uh, there's our matrix of, uh, of draws. Uh, now what we want to do is recover the 2.5th uh, 2, 2 and 97.5th percentile um, of those distributions. So for each... Um, a row, we're calculating the 2.5th uh, 2 percentile and 97.5th percentile um, of our draws. So in other words, what we're doing is we're saying um, if I do a plot of the density of dy dx draws for the first row, there it is. So there's our estimate of dy dx when z is negative 10, when it's at its smallest. If I want a confidence interval around that, I should say, okay, well, take the 2.5th the two, um, the 2 quantile on the left-hand side and the 97.5th quantile on the right-hand side, and that forms our estimate of the uncertainty of dy dx at that point. Now, so do that, and then just repeat that for every single value of z. So if I repeat that uh, for some other value of z, there you go. You can see that the effect has gotten smaller, um, and it's gotten smaller again, and smaller again. So every um, value of, uh, as the value of z um, increases, my estimate of dy dx is going down. Um, and the uncertainty around it can actually get wider or narrower as well. And the easiest thing to, the easiest way to show this is to just to draw lines. Whoops, I need to redraw my original plot here. There's my dy dx lines is just to draw um, lines um, around uh, uh, 
around the um, center, the central line, showing what the 2.5 and 97.5 quantile uh, looks like um, for each one of these locations. And you can see this line is a bit uh, shaky. Why is it a bit shaky? Well, this is a simulation-based process, so we're getting minor variations uh, due to, you know, in effect, the, the, the uh, simulation uh, variability. Um, but you can see that we're pretty clearly tracing out the uh, 2.5th and 97.5th confidence intervals around this, uh, uh, around this um, central line, and that it's pretty close to the uh, exact calculations that we um, constructed before. So I can just draw in those exact calculations again, and you can see it passes right through. It's almost indistinguishable from the simulated uh, densities. Uh, now, uh, we could um, go back through and, and smooth out these um, simulated confidence intervals using, for example, Lois regression, which we, the kernel regression, which we just learned. Um, we could draw a line through all these slightly variable points and get a 95% confidence interval that, was, that looked really nice and smooth um, and simulated. Uh, and if we were going to make this pretty, that's exactly what we would do. Um, but it, it actually, for, for illustrative purposes, it's kind of nice to see the variation because you can see we are simulating different values for each value of z. So you get a little bit of difference due to simulation you know, variability. Um, but in general, we are recovering uh, the right values and we're, we're getting the 95% confidence interval that we intended to. So that's a nice illustration of how parametric bootstrapping works. You repeatedly draw samples out of some target distribution. In this case, it was the distribution of the betas. And uh, that's going to allow us to recover some quantities of interest. In this case, 95% confidence intervals of uh, an, an interaction coefficient marginal effect, a dy dx. Um, in this case, we could verify that it was correct by checking the exact calculation, um, and that's nice to know. It's good for this illustrative example. But of course, in practice, what you're going to use this for is calculating um, the uncertainty around effects for which you don't know the exact formula. Um, and there are all sorts of situations you might run into where this happens. And it's nice to have bootstrapping in your back pocket as a way of doing that, which is why that clarify package by King, Thomas, and Wittenberg is so important and, and valuable, because it gives a, a way of encapsulating that tool um, making it easy to use for a wide variety of consumers and allows them to assess uncertainty of quantities uh, they might not otherwise be able to do. So that's an example of, of uh, parametric bootstrapping. So um, <clears throat> parametric bootstrapping still relies in some ways on the parametric nature of the model. Uh, we might take an approach that's even less dependent on parametric uh, models, which might be necessary uh, if there isn't one, or if we can't write down um, exact uh, nature of the parametric model. So for example, um, a lowest model um, has some sort of parametric form, and we can actually calculate standard errors in analytic ways out of them. Um, but it might be easier to do it in some other way. Um, or we might not know how to write down the parametric form of the standard errors for some particular complicate, particularly complicated models. Uh, we might think about doing this if the, um, there's something about the parametric formula for uncertainty that we think is questionably applicable to this situation. Uh, now, for example, there are lots of ways this might happen. Um, we might, for example, um, worry about certain forms of heteroscedasticity. Um, now, typically, there are easier ways to correct for that. We might, cons for example, consider um, just uh, drawing uh, or just using White's heteroscedasticity robust standard errors in that case. Um, but there are other reasons why we might um, doubt the parametric formula for uncertainty. For example, we might um, recognize that the model we're using is just an approximation, and so um, given that approximation, there's no guarantee that the um, derivations of the VCV matrix are, are, are valid and repre truly represent our uncertainty in, in um, the estimates. Uh, and uh, I think the biggest reason, at least in my book, is that um, very often it's easier to do um, than, in, uh, than parametric approaches or parametric bootstrapping if we don't know what the parametric model looks like. And it may be easier to bootstrap the answer than to um, sit down and figure out a proof and you know, write down some variance estimate uh, formula. So um, what non-parametric bootstrapping typically involves is sampling out of the data set to re with replacement, I should say, um, to um, uh, create a, a, what's called a bootstrap data set. Um, so you've got um, some kind of sample, you know, observations x1, x2, x3, and so on, all the way up to x sub n. 
Uh, and what you want to do, this is the actual sample data set, and what you want to do is create uh, bootstrap samples, B1, B2, you want to create a lot of them, uh, let's, say, let's say K many. Um, <clears throat> and what you do to create each uh, data set is you say, okay, I'm going to sample um, out, of, out of my sample, I'm going to sample out of my sample with replacement. So um, I'm actually going to uh, just get rid of this and suppose there's only three observations in my sample. So what I want to do is have an equal, whoops, an equal chance of selecting any three, any one of these three observations. So I might roll a three-sided mm, three dice? <laughs> Some kind of dice that gives a uh, die that gives an equal uh, probability of selecting each one of these uh, observations. So for example, I might pick the first observation is x1, but then I might pick x1 again, and then I might pick x3. Uh, the next time I might pick x3, uh, and then x2, and then x3 again. I might pick x2, and x2, and x2. I might pick the same observation three times. Um, I'm going to do this a whole lot of times. Um, and the reason I'm doing this a whole lot of times is that I'm mimicking the process of what would happen if I sampled repeatedly out of the true uh, distribution of x that's out there in the population. Of course, the rub is there is a population out there um, and this sample is a sample out of it, but we don't know what it is. Our best guess of the empirical, I'm sorry, our best guess of the distribution of X is the so-called empirical distribution that is found in our sample. So we're using that empirical distribution uh, in our sample of the target variables as our best estimate of the true distribution that's in the population. Um, so this procedure is, is sort of laid out here in, in steps one through six, the procedure I just described. Um, <clears throat> uh, what you're going to do with each one of these uh, data sets is you're going to estimate some model on each one of the bootstrap samples. And you're going to save the relevant model quantities um, out, of that, uh, out of that estimate. Uh, or I'm sorry, out, out, of that, uh, out of that data set. And you repeat this for every um, bootstrap data set. Um, so that you end up with each one of these bootstrap data sets giving you um, some kind of um, estimated quantity you're interested in. So you know, maybe we're interested in some parameter estimate. Um, uh, I can, I've got the, you know, the, uh, each one of my estimates here corresponding to um, uh, my bootstrap uh, data sets. I've got k many of them. What I can do is then say, okay, I want to I'll learn something about beta or beta hat um, from the fact that I repeated estimating beta hat in each one of these samples. Uh, a trivial sort of thing to do might say might be to say, okay, I want to know something about the distribution of uh, beta hat. So what I'll do is I'll um, create a frequency distribution. So here's the frequency of beta hat i, where this is i denotes a bootstrap observation, and I can construct a density estimate or a histogram, um, and then say, okay, here's my boot, non-parametrically bootstrapped simulation of the, um, of the uh, density of beta hat. Um, and in fact, usually what I'm doing is I'm estimating uh, if I believe that beta actually exists in the world, what I'm uh, doing via this procedure is estimating the density of beta itself using this bootstrap procedure. So um, whatever the median of this uh, um, estimated bootstrap density is, I might say is my um, estimate of the uh, median of beta. So I might put a bar on that. That's my estimate of the median of beta. Actually, I think is median double bar and mean one bar. I always forget the, these conventions. Let's put a double bar mean double bar, or beta double bar hat, that's our estimate of the median of beta. <clears throat> now, um, what we're doing is we're appealing to properties of sampling distributions in order to uh, justify uh, what we've done here. Um, and uh, it, we're going to be able to do uh, multiple things uh, with this procedure, or with this, uh, with this, um, the products of bootstrapping. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what can we do with the products of bootstrapping? Uh, well, one thing we could do is uh, directly construct 95% um, confidence intervals by selecting the 2 and a 5th and 97.5th quantiles of the simulated quantity. So going back to the previous page, we simulated lots of draws of beta hat here. If we want to construct a, what's called a percentile confidence interval, 
for beta hat, we just select the 2.5th and 97.5th est uh, estimates, or I'm sorry, 2.5th and 97.5th quantiles of all of our simulated values for beta hat, and that, cr that becomes our confidence interval. So recreating that um, graph from earlier, uh, here's our um, f of beta hat. We um, construct a estimate of the density of beta hat using um, our bootstrapped estimates. And uh, here's as beta hat right here. And so what we do is just say, here's the 2.5th quantile. Here's the 97.5th quantile. There's our bootstrap estimate for the 95% confidence interval. That's a very simple way of using bootstrap estimates to construct confidence intervals. And of course, we can conduct hypothesis tests in a related way. If, for example, we want to test for whether beta hat equals zero, um, uh, or is distinguishable, statistically distinguishable from zero, we can say, um, well, um, let's look and see whether that 95% confidence interval overlaps zero. If not, we can reject the null hypothesis that beta is zero uh, with confidence 0.05, two-tailed. Um, usual way of applying confidence intervals to hypothesis tests. Um, you can also incidentally construct bootstrap p percentile p-values in a similar way. For example, if, um, if our uh, if our, uh, this is zero right here, and our test was for uh, beta being greater than zero, we could compute the p-value as the shaded, uh, as the um, proportion of the bootstrap samples that are to the left of zero, and that would form a one-tailed p-value for whether beta hat was bigger than zero. So, sort of pretty standard procedure. Uh, but there are other things we could do as well. For example, what we could do is um, say, well, um, what I'm going to do is instead of bootstrapping beta directly or beta hat, I'm going to bootstrap some uh, construct of beta hat. So maybe, for example, I'll bootstrap um, uh, the variance of, of the estimate of beta hat. So I'll get an, a bootstrap estimate of the variance in beta hat. And then I'll say, I'm going to assume that beta hat is distributed normally. And I'm going to use my bootstrap estimate of the variance as my um, confidence interval, um, in my confidence interval formula. So as you may know, the ordinary um, uh, formula for a 95% confidence interval, um, two-tailed, you know, 0.05 two-tailed, is uh, beta hat plus uh, 1.96 uh, times um, uh, the standard error of beta. Uh, all we're doing here is we're saying instead of using the standard error of beta computed from a parametric formula, um, estimate this via bootstrapping by computing the uh, variance of all of our bootstrap estimates that we recovered earlier. So we get a bunch of beta hats out of our out of our uh, k many um, bootstrap replicates. We compute the variance of that quantity. That becomes our estimate of the variance. But then, once we have that bootstrap variance, we plug it back into a formula that assumes a normal distribution of beta hat, namely uh, this one. Uh, and as you can see, the, the, norm, the assumption of normality comes in in the fact that we can use this uh, t-statistic multiplier here, or the 1.96. That, uh, that t statistic multiplier ha obviously assumes that uh, beta hat has to be distributed t or in the limit normally. So that's another way of using bootstrap estimates that's a little more parametric uh, than pure percentile distribution, um, but it allows for a little bit of um, bad behavior uh, in, in, um, in our data set, dirty data set, for example, that may make the um, approximation of uh, the variance formula a bad approximation for the true variance in beta hat. <clears throat> there are, there's another thing we could do. Uh, we could use a bootstrap calculation of um, some relevant statistic, like the t statistic. So what we could do is instead of bootstrapping beta hat, we could bootstrap t. Uh, we calculate the t value for each um, estimate of beta hat and that use the critical t values that we, uh, that we recover from bootstrapping to construct a confidence interval. So you run k many um, you run k many replicates. You estimate k many um, beta hats in each uh, out of each data set. You compute the t statistic for each beta hat replicate, assuming that the true value is 
the originally estimated beta hat. And then you say, okay, use those T values as the multiplier here. So what I'm doing here is bootstrapping this in short. I'm using bootstrapping to determine the multiplier that goes in front of the um, in front of the confidence interval formula. Instead of assuming it's 1.96, which would assume normality, I'm going to compute, well, what are the limits I should be using given repeated bootstrap samples? Now this might be easiest to see if we actually if you actually do it. That's the doing is a very illustrate it's a very good to illustrate this process to get a sense of what we're actually doing here. So in a second we're going to go into R and, and, and do this and you'll see what we're doing here. But what you'll see here is that what we've done is we've um, mixed various um, uh, degrees of parametric and non-parametric techniques to create these um, confidence intervals. <coughs> and the reason that we do that is because, um, the more we can use parametric um, assumptions, the more efficient of an answer we'll get. The narrower the confidence intervals will be, and that's good. Uh, the question is, are these assumptions good ones? You know, are, is adding this parametric information to the model a good idea? Um, there is no universal answer for whether that's true. Um, Monte Carlo simulations can help you determine uh, in various candidate scenarios whether <clears throat> using um, degrees of parametric approximation is justified. Um, I think a generally good idea is just to see um, whether in all three scenarios you get a statistically significant result. And if you do, um, you know, maybe use the least confident um, of them just to be safe. Um, if you give di different answers, then really start to delve into your particular problem and see whether the uh, certain assumptions you're using to construct these confidence intervals is justified. Uh, so now let's take a look at, at how to do this in practice to give you a better sense of, of what we're doing here and, and how it's different. All right, so let's do some uh, non-parametric bootstrapping. So what I'm going to do is, uh, just as before, I'm going to make a data set um, that, that um, comes out of an interaction term uh, linear model. Uh, there we go. And I've uh, created this data set in a data frame called dat, which labels the variables y, x, and z. And what I'm going to do is uh, create a, a percentile uh, bootstrap uh, estimator. So um, what I'm going to do is, uh, in order to do this, use the bootstrap library, which I've, you can see I've loaded up here. And the bootstrap library um, just implements some, some easy uh, ways to uh, loop over and, and sample with replacement out of, a, uh, out of a sample data set that you have. But in order to make this work, what you have to do is uh, tell it what you want to compute repeatedly. This is the so-called theta value in the bootstrap command. So if you call up the help file, for the bootstrap command, you'll see that you have to give it a theta, which is the function to be bootstrapped. <clears throat> so we're going to give it a function called boot.func. And um, the uh, bootstrapping is actually going to take place over an index value. So what I'm going to do is repeatedly draw indices for the data set, that is to say rows out of the data set um, to sample out of. And then dat.in is going to be the data set we're actually going to sample out of. So the very first line of the command of this function just says, um, <clears throat> select the lines of the data set um, that you're given to by end and call that dat dot boot. The reason we have to do it that way is that the bootstrap command uh, likes to bootstrap out of um, a, a one-dimensional vectors. And so um, if you've got a multi-dimensional matrix that you're trying to bootstrap out of, like any data set typically would be, you need to um, data, bootstrap out of its uh, 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 out of its indexes from 1 to n instead of directly bootstrapping out of it. That's the only trick there. So um, out of this bootstrap data set, the uh, boot func um, procedure uh, recovers the coefficients from a linear model and then constructs, <clears throat> just as before, uh, the DOIDX line for a bunch of different values of z. So this is the DOIDX line for values of z from negative 10 to 10, and then it spits that line back out. So if I uh, do this, and I um, say, okay, I want to um, run boot.func, and I'm just going to give it a bunch of um, different data sets, or data values here. Now, this, um, the length of the data set is 50, so I can't give it indices over 50 or it'll crash. Uh, and then I need to give it the data set here, dat. 
and it returns uh, a line. <clears throat> it, boots, it, it took my indexes that I fed it, it ran a regression, and then it recovered the estimated line out of that, um, out of that uh, sample data set. So I'm just going to do this over and over again, but the bootstrap command is going to give it a, a, a list of indexes here. So this is the list of indexes right here. It's just going to give it a, a whole bunch of these um, over and over again uh, of length 50 that might include some repeats because, of course, we're sampling with repetition. In fact, it almost certainly will uh, include some repeat observations. <clears throat> so that's what I'm doing right here in this bootstrap command. I'm uh, bootstrapping out of boot.funk. I'm doing it 500 times using the uh, data set dat. Um, and if, you just, uh, if I just do this one time and show you what the overall output of it looks like, you see it shoots out a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, the first thing it shoots out is um, the actual uh, bootstrap replicates. And we've got a whole bunch of them. It should be a, a, a length 500. Uh, and, or I'm sorry, I guess column, 500 columns, which correspond to the replicates, and uh, um, 20 uh, rows, which are actually 21 rows, which correspond to all the different points of Z that we're bootstrapping dydx out of. It also shoots out func.theta star, jackboot val, and jackboot se, and the call. These are um, optional commands that you can use. Uh, you can have the, uh, the bootstrap command directly compute a function and then compute its, what's called its jackknife um, variance estimate. <clears throat> Jackknifing is a, a related non-parametric command that I'm not covering in this lecture. Um, if I was going to do it, I probably would not do it internally to the bootstrap command. I would use uh, another command. There's a jackknife command that you can use to do this. Uh, or I would write my own jackknife routine. But anyway, just so you know, it's there. And, and the point for this particular exercise is we can ignore those additional, um, <clears throat> those additional outputs and focus just on the theta star output right here. The theta star output is the bootstrap values of theta. So I'm going to um, store in boot.samp the only piece of this I want, which is the bootstrap replicates. So now what I'm going to do is construct bootstrap confidence intervals. And so to each one of these um, rows of x, I'm going to ask for the 2.5th, the 50th, and the 97.5th quantiles of my bootstrap replications. So I save that in boot.ci, and then I just plot the result. Uh, ooh, I need to make sure to have zplot loaded in memory so it has uh, something to plot against. Oh, and it's not called xplot, it's called zplot. Save that right there. There we go. So there's our uh, dy dx um, simulated uh, confidence interval, and actually the center line is simulated as well. <clears throat> and we simulated that uh, via bootstrapping. Uh, and um, what we, we actually bootstrapped out of the, um, uh, non-parametrically out of the sample data set, instead of bootstrapping um, out of the, um, um, out of the um, limiting distribution of beta as we did in the parametric case. So just to give you a sense of um, <clears throat> how, does, uh, how does this uh, par uh, parametric bootstrap compare, or non-parametric bootstrap compare, to the um, exact calculation of the uh, confidence intervals, uh, what I'm going to do is add in here. Um, these are the um, confidence intervals that we calculated previously via the exact method. Um, and I'm going to um, plot them in blue so that you can see them distinctly. So just come in here and add a blue here. And if these are still in memory, let's see if they are. Oh, I bet they're not still in memory. So we need to reconstruct them. That's OK. It only takes a second to reconstruct them. Um, let's see. We can come in here and just do this. Run that. And then rerun what we ran before. There we go. So there are the bootstrap confidence intervals plotted against the um, blue exact confidence intervals, and you can see they're um, pretty close. <clears throat> the blue con uh, confidence intervals are um, a little bit narrower, but you can also see that the um, bootstrap confidence intervals um, are, w when you get to the left side or the right side of the graph where zplot is, is near to 10, so if I just come in here and highlight this, um, down here where we're near to 10, uh, you can see that um, the bootstrap confidence intervals actually go uh, further up um, than the um, 
exactly conf uh, calculated confidence intervals. Uh, but they're they're pretty close, um, and the 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 uh, exactly confident uh, calculated confidence intervals are actually inside of the bootstrap ones over here to the left. Uh, that's <clears throat> not surprising for two reasons. Firstly, the exact ones are narrower because they take advantage of parametric information and thus are more efficient. And given the fact that uh, parametric estimates in this case are completely accurate because we generated the DGP and we know that they come out of the right model they're going to be a little bit better. Um, we can also see the confidence intervals are a little bit different in the bootstrap case, which is also to be expected because the bootstrap estimator is not bound, uh, the percentile estimator is not bound to any kind of linearity assumption um, in, the sen in the sense that um, it doesn't, uh, it's not forced to uh, sort of make things balance in a certain way. Um, so uh, it it's not surprising that our confidence intervals look a little different um, in terms of their location. Um, in this case, it's actually not uh, advantageous because we know the parametric estimates are probably going to be better. Um, but in cases that where we don't know what the DGP is, which is to say every real data set, uh, it might well be better. <clears throat> so that's uh, one way um, of doing parametric bootstrapping. Uh, now, suppose I impose the uh, T distribution uh, like I did before, um, but I use bootstrap bias corrected mean estimates instead. So uh, what am I doing here? Uh, well, what I'm doing here is um, I'm estimating uh, a, a, the linear model and the coefficients just as I did before using the standard uh, models. Uh, then what I'm doing is uh, bootstrapping um, uh, uh, from my boot samples, I'm calculating the standard error of the bootstrap samples. So that's the estimated standard error of beta, uh, of, I'm sorry, of dydx rather. <clears throat> for each value of z that I've calculated for. So that I've estimated a standard, DV, a standard error of, uh, of the spread of the beta estimates for each point. I can also calculate how far the, the median estimate or the mean estimate is um, from the um, bootstrap... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, let me say this a little differently. I can calculate how far the average bootstrap sample estimate is from the original estimate that we recovered via the model. So what I've done here is I've calculated what's called bootstrap sample bias. And all I'm doing is I'm taking um, <clears throat> the matrix of, I'm creating a matrix of the original estimated coefficient, uh, the original estimated dy dx's from the um, sample. And then I'm subtracting all of my bootstrap sampling calculations of the same quantity from that and then computing a mean to get the bootstrap bias. So all this bootstrap bias vector is, is <clears throat> on average, how far is the line estimated from the uh, original sample from the average estimate of the bootstrap samples? So in other words, we're assuming that the original model uh, might be biased in some way um, and that bootstrap sampling will allow us to recover that bias um, and, and we can adjust our original estimate accordingly. <clears throat> so that's what I've done here. Um, I've uh, calculated um, <clears throat> the main line, uh, subtracting the so-called bootstrap bias from that. And then to calculate standard, the standard errors, I've added 1.96 times plus or minus uh, 1.96 times the bootstrap standard error to that main line. So... If I go in there and plot <clears throat> what I've just created, there we are. There's our semi-parametric um, uh, estimate of the confidence interval. Um, semi-parametric because I've used bootstrapping non-parametrically to determine the, the standard error and the line bias, so to speak. Uh, but I've used a parametric assumption that the um, distribution of beta is normal to use this confidence interval formula that I've ordinary that I always use when I can use the uh, exact estimates. Now here's how this compares to the percentile bootstrap estimates. And you can see there that again they're a little different. They're in the ballpark, but a little bit different. And uh, we would expect the um, the semi-parametric estimates leveraging the T formula to be a little bit more efficient. Um, it actually looks like you don't get a lot of efficiency in, in this case out of the um, out of the procedure, but in general we might expect it to be a bit more efficient because there's a bit more parametric information that's included. So that's a way you can use 
um, <clears throat> non-parametric bootstrapping to um, inform a parametric confidence interval result. So that's one thing you could do. Uh, the third thing is uh, bootstrap T confidence intervals. And what we're doing here is instead of calculating um, uh, the bootstrap samples directly, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the T statistic for each bootstrap sample. So what I've done here is create a matrix called boot.t. And what I'm going to do a thousand times is I'm going to draw with replacement um, a sample from the data set. I'm going to run a model on that sample. I'm going to recover the coefficients. I'm going to calculate dy, dx using the uh, interaction term formula. I'm going to recover the variance covariance matrix from the model. Uh, and then I'm going to calculate the standard error um, of dy, dx at each point z <coughs> in my bootstrap estimate. Then finally, and I'm going to store this last bit, I'm going to calculate the t statistic for the distance from the original calculated line for my sample to the line I just calculated using my bootstrap sample divided by the standard error that I calculated from the bootstrap sample. Now in this case, note, SE boot, that's not doing a thousand estimates and then calculating the standard error of beta. We're doing something differently this time. What we're doing is we're recovering the estimated standard errors from the model that we estimated on that data set. So SE boot, as you can see, is actually calculated using that exact confidence interval formula, the, the um, variance of beta 1 plus uh, z squared times the variance of beta 2 plus 2 times the covariance between beta 1 and beta 2. Right, so we're using the exact formula. The trick is we're using bootstrap replicates of that to calculate bootstrap replicates of the SE, which gives us bootstrap replicates of T. So I'm going to do this a thousand times, and in a fast computer, it only takes just a, just a second to calculate this thousand bootstrap estimates. Already done. Now, if you look at the head of boot.t, what I've got here is for all 21 points of Z, from negative 10 to 10 that I'm plotting here, right here, I've got T statistics corresponding to how, quote unquote, statistically significant the difference was of the estimated dy dx in that sample, in that bootstrap sample from my original estimate. So what I'm going to do is figure out, okay, what was the 2.5 and, and 97.5 and percentile of those T values at each point Z? So if you look at t vowels right here, whoops, t dot vowels, <coughs> these are the bootstrapped t limits that I should use to calculate a 95% confidence interval if I'm relying on the bootstrap estimates. Now, normally I would go from negative 1.96 to 1.96 or something thereabouts, right? Now this is a small sample of only 50, so I might use the t uh, downward deflation estimate and, you know, pump that up a bit to in the twos. Uh, what you can see here is that my bootstrap estimates of, of the critical T statistic, that's because that's what I'm bootstrapping, is the boot, critical T statistic, uh, are a little bit bigger. They're in the 2.3 uh, range for small values of Z, next close to negative 10. Uh, and uh, they, they sort of drift around um, between two and two and a half um, at various other values of, of Z. So now I'm gonna use those T values as the multipliers to construct my confidence interval. So instead of 1.96 times the standard error, and remember the standard error is actually coming from the original model on the original sample, not the bootstrap. It's the T statistic, the critical T multiplier that is coming out of the bootstrap. So instead of 1.96, I'm using these T values that I created. So now if I plot that, I get confidence intervals again. How do those look different from the bootstrap confidence intervals uh, using percentile, the percentile method? Uh, they're a little different. <clears throat> they're a little bit uh, further down, um, but in the same ballpark again. So in this case, we've leveraged a little bit of parametric information because we're assuming that the distribution of beta is normal, <clears throat> but what we're not assuming is that uh, it necessarily follows the um, asymptotics um, of the Z of, or the normal. Now, in other words, we uh, it might be the case that the critical T statistics are different for each point Z depending on local qualities of the sample. So we've bootstrapped something, but it's something different. So to sum up what we've done in these cases, we're always bootstrapping, 
we're always drawing multiple draws out of the um, out of the uh, a sample to construct uh, repeated um, measurements of some kind of quantity of interest. What's changed is what we're computing and what we're storing and then how we're using that to construct the final estimates. In pure percentile bootstrapping, we're just saving the betas. And this is usually what Clarify does. In the bootstrap T confidence interval case and in the uh, semi-parametric uh, bias, bias and standard error corrected bootstrap estimates, we're actually saving either standard errors and bias statistics, or we're saving T statistics from the bootstrap. So always bootstrapping something, but what we're bootstrapping can be different from case to case, and that might get you a little bit more efficiency in, in, in some cases. So there's a lot of literature written uh, on this. I'm not an expert on it by any means. Um, you can go much deeper into figuring out when each of these things is optimal um, in different circumstances. Um, what I recommend, as usual, is in your particular application, um, reading the literature, try to get a sense of, of which of these techniques might be the most optimal. And if all else fails um, and there's no literature on your specific application, which is very common, try doing some explore, exploratory Monte Carlo to see which bootstrap approach will be uh, the most efficient, which will be the best and get you the best answers on average. So uh, for the last bit today, I want to talk a little bit about some new ideas that are um, coming into political science uh, in the front of non-parametric analysis. And one of those ideas is uh, laid out in uh, Kelly Rader's uh, 2010 manuscript where uh, she addresses an outline, uh, an outstanding problem in uh, political methodology, how to deal with uh, data that is intrinsically clustered uh, where we expect there to be complex correlations um, between the independent variables um, and then between the independent variables and the dependent variable inside that cluster. So uh, a canonical example of this is an experiment uh, where you run R sessions, um, and so for example, you know we have uh, we can't have all the subjects in the lab at the same time, um, so we uh, run five or six different sessions, um, each for say two or three different treatments, and then the total number of people in the subjects is uh, K R, where K is the number of people in each session, and R is the number of sessions. Uh, the problem here is that the uh, unmodeled per proportion of the variance, the error term um, in whatever we're trying to model, uh, might, be, um, uh, might be very complicated because uh, the uh, subject's errors inside of a session might be correlated with one another in unpredictable ways. Um, the idea here is that when you put a bunch of people in a room and have them interact as part of a, a laboratory experiment, like some kind of um, economic experiment uh, or something like that, um, the fact that they're interacting with each other uh, at a particular day, at a particular time, with a particular crowd of people might have some influence on uh, what they do, a uh, net of the effect of the treatment. And um, we're not measuring that because, uh, first of all, we have no way or we have very poor ways of recovering the necessary covariates about who those people are and what they're doing and how they interact with one another. And secondly, uh, we may not have very much leverage on the question because we're only running four, five, six sessions per treatment. So we may only have, you know, if we have four sessions and three treatments, in some senses we only have 12 observations at the treatment, or I'm sorry, at the session level. Um, now, that, the, the problem is that, of course, these treatment conditions that we've imposed are often constant by session. So different sessions are exposed to different treatments. And we want to be able to recover the effect of the treatment uh, without having it commingled with whatever these uh, session level error term clustering things are going on. Um, if we um, don't model the within session intersubject correlation, that might interfere with our estimation of uh, the variance of the treatment effect. And usually the problem is it pushes that variance uh, to be too small. Um, it could be the case that uh, there's a greater variance in the treatment effect than we are realizing because inter-subject inter, um, inter correlation in the error terms is positive within a treatment which tends to um, sort of lump together all of the, um, all of the error terms um, which tends to de-emphasize the variation in treatment effect because the clustering effect tends to pull all the observations in the cluster closer together. Now there are lots of ways of dealing with this and one of the, uh, the ways, the standard ways that's popular in the econometrics uh, in, in, in actually really in the experimental economics um, literature is clustered robust standard errors. 
Um, <clears throat> without going into great depth about what CRSEs are or what they do, uh, it suffices to say that they can perform poorly um, when the number of treatments, I'm sorry, take it back, when the number of sessions is small. So we expect clustering at the session level uh, in this experiment. If you have a small number of sessions, like 12 or 14, cluster robust standard errors can actually make the variance deflation problem worse. If you apply cluster robust standard errors, what often happens is um, the, uh, the degree of variation in the, um, uh, in the uh, estimate of the treatment effect actually gets shrunk. It gets shrunk smaller than it should be, and it gets shrunk even beyond um, uh, what, it, uh, uh, what it would be with vanilla standard errors. Now, to make all this really even better, there are actually some rare cases where, uh, where the uh, variance in the estimate treatment is too big, and the uh, cluster uh, robust standard errors shrink the uh, standard errors appropriately. Um, which is, of course, it's very difficult, it's not impossible to tell in any particular data set whether that's what's happening. Uh, but there have been some pretty recent Monte Carlo studies published in Political Analysis and elsewhere, uh, in Angrist and Pischke's book, for example, uh, that indicate that on average, uh, on balance, you should not use cluster robust standard errors when you have a small number of treatments. Um, now, that raises the question, what do we do? And there are some suggestions in the Angrist and Pischke book about how to deal with that. Um, but uh, Kelly Rader has a suggestion um, in her article where she suggests applying what's called a randomization test. Uh, it's a generalization of uh, these non-parametric principles that we've, we've been applying all throughout uh, the lecture. So uh, the idea um, in this particular uh, 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 application is to um, estimate, a, 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 a estimate a model on, on a sample where the JDR degenerating process is, you know, y is beta 0 plus beta 1x plus beta 2z. Um, and actually, since that's the DGP, I should uh, add in an error term uh, inside the, no, here we go, plus epsilon. Uh, there's our uh, example DGP, where j indexes the group, so like the treatment effect. I'm sorry, the session. Uh, and i in uh, indexes individual. So um, each uh, treatment, um, I'm sorry, I apologize, each session is associated with um, a group level treatment effect. So all the people in the session get the same treatment, okay? So you estimate the model in the sample data set, but then to calculate the variance of beta 2, um, what we should do is shuffle the values of z uh, among all the different session groups, but ensure that each member of the group receives the same value of z. So what you do is you sort of take the z observations, um, which are, con uh, the, the, that number is constant inside of, a, inside of a group, and you take all the group z away and you replace it with something else, but you replace it with another group's z. You don't replace each individual's z with a randomly selected z, you replace the entire group. So what you're doing is, in effect, a, a form of bootstrap resampling or reassignment. Permutation testing, actually, is what it's, is, is what it's called. But you're, uh, you're shuffling the values of the, of the variable at the group level as opposed to at the individual level. And you do that a large number of times, like a thousand times. You compute whatever t-statistic you're interested in for that particular data set. I'm sorry, for that particular variable, for each one of these shuffled replicates. And then that gives you the distribution of the test statistic. So then you compare the value of the test statistic you calculated from the original sample, like a t, to uh, the distribution that you constructed via this permutation process. And uh, you see whether uh, you calculate the p-value by looking at um, how far out your original calculated um, t statistic is in the in the um, per, uh, permut uh, permutation testing created distribution. So the idea is uh, where are we? Oh my thing turned itself off. Um, we've got some kind of um, test statistic that we've calculated from a data set. You know, so here's t, uh, and and here we've got it right here, but we don't know what the distribution it comes out of is. And uh, it would be uh, so that if the null is zero, it might be wrong to use the standard. Um, the standard t distribution um, that might be a bad choice because um, this interclass cl uh, clustering uh, may make it so that the distribution of the statistic is no longer what we would ordinarily expect it to be under the usual CLNRM uh, classical linear normal regression model assumptions. 
So we compute this, we do this permutation process or this randomization process to build up a whole bunch of t-statistics for each one of the permuted samples to construct a new test statistic. And that test statistic distribution, we expect it to be wider than the original test statistic distribution, although it doesn't necessarily have to be. And so what that does is it's going to deflate the um, value of our, uh, of, our, of our t statistic that we calculated because it's going to um, account for the fact that there's interclass correlation um, uh, when we, uh, in, in the distribution of the, of the uh, test statistic. So um, she has some Monte Carlo, some reasonably preliminary Monte Carlo simulations to, um, to back up this procedure. Um, it's also supported by some previous uh, literature which she cites. And if you're um, uh, do it following along with the homework assignments, one of the assignments for this week is going to be to um, uh, redo uh, the simulation process that she, the Monte Carlo simulations that she did in order to justify this procedure. And then we're going to relax some of the assumptions that she imposed, as she suggests in the uh, final page of the paper, to sort of figure out whether this testing procedure is robust to those relaxations. In particular, going back to the original model, um, in her uh, p uh, paper, she assumed that um, X and Z were uncorrelated. And uh, very often it's the case that they are um, quite correlated, that the um, things that are going on um, inside of a group um, are, uh, are, it's not just that the unmodeled stuff that's the same, it's also some of the stuff you're trying to measure is also the same. Uh, this procedure would apply, obviously, to some experimental data sets, as I've mentioned, but it also would apply to lots of other cases, like, for example, survey data sets by country, where you expect clustering by country, for example. Um, anyway, uh, it's, it's an interesting idea and an interesting application of uh, nonparametric um, techniques and uh, might eventually lead us to um, some solutions to some outstanding problems in political science. Uh, well, that's it for this week. Uh, thanks for uh, listening, and I'll see you next time.